Mobile One The Grid gets underway today with NASCAR as we meet SHR's team leader, Kevin Harvick. After two decades in the NASCAR Cup Series, Kevin Harvick could be hanging up his racing boots, but instead he's committed to Stuart Haas Racing to the end of 2023. I like my team. If Rodney was done with it, I'd probably be done with it. And, and you know, I think, um, you know, for, for me, I like where I race. I like Stuart Haas Racing. I like the group of guys that I started here with. That's why they all came here. And I would feel like I was abandoning them if I just didn't go a couple more years. Through my whole career, the longest I've ever worked with anybody was three years. So uh, to be with somebody for going on nine is crazy. It's kind of been easy from the beginning. We've been super competitive every single season. And I think we both have the same goals and the same mindset. And to have a, a championship driver that can go out there and win races and do the things that he does. It's just, you know, nobody on this team ever wants to work with anybody else anymore because it's been so good. Harvick, crew chief Rodney Childers and the number four car team have won a championship and 35 races in their first eight years together. Their experience is such that even when they're not winning, they're still scoring. Well, there's just different ways to race, right? And sometimes it's today we're going to run fourth and being able to accept that if we have a fourth place car, we need to finish fourth. On the days when stuff is chaotic and there's cars torn up everywhere and you finish ninth with a 20th place car, those are really big wins. So you just have to figure out how to manage that and also manage it when you have fast cars, slow cars, intermediate cars, know what you have that day and get the most out of that day. Last season, Harvick guided a struggling SHR car into the playoffs despite not getting to victory lane. But there was some friction with the young 2020 champion Chase Elliott that ended with aggression from both sides. You're always going to have some sort of controversy when you're competitive, right? It's a very different system than what you had before, so you have to be more aggressive all the time because of the stages and the importance of restarts. That has definitely changed the way that you race. It's very cutthroat. You don't really worry about anybody else. They have been taught from the time that they race to be full tilt. It's a different mentality than it used to be, and I think part of the success that we had in just being where we wound up at the end of last year is because they also don't know how to manage their car. And they wind up in more wrecks, they wind up with more torn up fenders, they wind up with more mistakes. And it allowed us to go from winning nine races two years ago and last year winning no races to finishing the same spot in the points. We knew how to race a different way and in the end you got the same result. The next gen car also changes things for Harvick. A lot more centralized parts from NASCAR make it harder for teams to find a performance advantage through experienced engineering and team communication. For a team that we're on the forefront of developing things, it's a little bit of a culture shock that will take a long time for me to get used to because I've been a part of that innovation and the evolution of cars for you know, my whole career. That was just part of what you do. I've been surprised about how into it he's been. Somebody that's done as much as he has with the old school cars. You wondered at times whether he would just walk away and not want to do anything with this new car. And he's been super involved. And the good thing about him is just how fast he learns. I think he learns faster than anybody in the field. And he figures out how to drive something. And he's really good at using his feet. And, doing things that other people can't do. Part of the reason that I've been somewhat successful is just that I know what I want in the car. We've just been able to figure out the communication with what you're feeling in the car and how we fix it, what fixes it, what pushes the hot buttons. They believe in the direction that I tell them to go and they're good at finding things that, that help solve that problem. At 46, Harvick may be the oldest driver in the Cup Series field, but he has the experience and the team to add to his 58 Cup wins before he hangs up those racing boots. A lot of professional sports depend on your body and speed and agility and all those things. Our sport has a huge value in experience. Those street smarts that, that come along with just making decisions on the fly and being able to survive and how you handle all those things is probably a lot better than it used to be instead of just banging your fist on the table and saying we need to do this and cause a bunch of commotion and walk out. So, <laughs> so it's just 25 to 46, that's a long time and, and you learn a lot in between. F1 now as we catch up with Oracle Red Bull Racing. Formula One's new era is well underway and Red Bull Racing are at full throttle in a championship fight which continues to provide attacking racing and thrilling overtaking. On these new regulations you have to be attacking all the time. Whether you're defending or attacking, 
it's the same strategy, you know, you have to go for it all the time because otherwise uh, they will get you. If definitely the new changes made it you know, easier to follow. It's still, I mean, an F1 car is always going to be difficult to follow just because of the high speeds you get through the corners, but it definitely improved. So we are on a good way. We just need to try and, of course, continue to find other solutions to it. From round one in Bahrain to Red Bull's latest victory in Monaco, F1's new regulations have enabled cars to follow closely, producing wheel-to-wheel -wheel battles at the front of the grid. Every scenario is, of course, a bit different when you're chasing or attacking, but overall, I think these cars are a bit of an improvement following, and I think that's all what we wanted as drivers. It gives you a few more opportunities, at least, to battle it out. It's great because you are able to race a lot closer. It's a bit like going back to karting days, where you were fighting all the way through. It's quite a good fun to actually be able to race closely to other cars. As Red Bull engineers strive to maintain a winning edge, there's no room for mistakes in pit lane or on the track, particularly with race strategy. It's very important and fundamental to be able to determine that good strategy, good planning, that's key to our race weekends. It's always very important to be on it with the strategy and of course to be faultless because I mean, there's so many good people involved in also the other teams, so every tiny mistake will be punished. F1's refresh has seen post-pandemic crowds returning in numbers and it's inspiring the world champion in a close title race. It's great to see the fans, of course, you know, for them as well, it has been tough and uh, like, of course, the rest of the world, but we were all very excited to be back and to see that amount of fans, you know, really also shows you that F1 is becoming more and more popular. Delighted fans witness Sergio Perez's triumph in Monaco, a hard-fought race in difficult conditions. The Mexicans' victory was a real crowd pleaser. It's great to see their faces. They're really happy to be back, you know, and see how Formula One is evolving, how much it's improving. And the sport itself is just great, and um, the fans are enjoying it. Drivers, teams, I think we have a really good sport at the moment. We head to the dirt tracks of the USA next to meet a late model racer. Max Blair is in his rookie year driving the full World of Outlaws program in dirt late models. Now age 32, he was virtually born at the racetrack. I've just raced my entire life. My dad raced. I think he started racing when he was 14, so my whole life I went racing with him. And uh, just I started driving when I was 15, and I think this is like my 18th year in a car or something like that. So. Which is all I've ever done. Oh man, rookie contender Max Blair wins a Cherokee. Blair competes in a V8 Chevrolet powered rocket chassis for the 111 V Viper Motorsport team. While the world of outlaws take their dirt show all over the USA, late models are a little different to the mainstream of racing. I guess everybody's normal is a little different, right? Um, this is my normal and I go to a, an asphalt track. That stuff looks different to me. I've never drove an asphalt car, so I guess I don't really have nothing to compare it to. This is all I've ever really done is the dirt stuff. And, um, I guess I, I did hot lap an asphalt car one time, that was terrible, so I uh, had a hard time keeping it straight. Despite the grueling schedule of more than 60 races between January and November, Blair is in his element on the dirt. But he appreciates that others have transferred the undoubted skill needed to race on the surface all the way to the NASCAR Cup Series. Well, it seems like in today's world, a lot of the guys coming from dirt are really succeeding in the, the upper levels too. You know, I mean, obviously Kyle Larson is the first person you look at. You know, that dude, he's probably the best person to ever sit behind the wheel of a race car. The likes of Cup Series champion Larson often boost the fields of the big World of Outlaws events, and they don't come much bigger than the Dirt Car Nationals in Florida in March. This deal down here is the best of the best. Every good car in the country is here pretty much, so it's a, it's a real deal. I've been here before and seen Tony Stewart. I've been here and seen Clint Boyer. You know, them guys, obviously Kyle Larson, you know. When it comes to dirt late model racing, next to the Eldora stuff, this is about as big as it gets. Blair brings his son to the track, just as his own father did. There's a good chance there'll be a third generation racer before long. And dad is certainly setting a great racing example on the Outlaws Tour. He's challenging at the top of the national standings, looking very good for Rookie of the Year honors and winning races. This is my first year um, really being out on the road doing it at this level. We've raced our way in each of the outlaw sanctioned races with the competition we're racing against. I'm, I'm very happy with that. I'm hopeful I don't jinx myself, but so far we, we've been competitive and uh, for my first time doing this, that's all I can really ask for right now. Into turn number three, only the third driver this year has won two races. This is that driver and it is Max Blair. He'll win at Bloomsburg. 
time to hit the stages now with the ultimate high-speed car share. Elvin Evans' seat of your pants style lights up the stages of the WRC. It's carried him to within touching distance of the World Championship and relies on a unique partnership with co-driver Scott Martin. Well, of course, unlike any other form of, of motorsport, there's, there's two of us in the car, uh, which is quite an exclusive thing to, to rally. And, of course, the role of the co-driver is to read out the pace notes at the exact perfect timing for me to process them and drive the corner as, as fast as possible. He has to trust that I, I deliver the, the pace notes at the right time, uh, not too fast, not too slow, not too early, not too late. And then I have to have a lot of trust in him that he's going to drive to what I've said because there's a lot of challenges when we get out there. We don't really know what's coming up, so we rely on that information entirely to know where we are on the road. And therefore, it's the ultimate trust on my side that he can deliver those notes at the right time. And I guess he has to trust me for his own safety. With the Yaris topping 200 kilometers per hour and high speed jumps, rocks and trees ready to punish the slightest mistake, perfect pace notes and a telepathic understanding are vital. And flat right long, just in. It probably took six months, therefore about six rallies, for him to really understand what I meant with all my pace notes and for him to deliver them in the perfect way that I wanted. Uh, let's say it started at a good level, but probably took six months to get fully comfortable with one another. Three left, in of a crest new, and right of a crest 40. It's one thing that I really saw when I was back in my early days, and it really intrigued me, this relationship. It's something that really got me hooked, and I thought, yeah, I want a piece of that. I love the team aspect. I love working with the mechanics and the engineers and all the personnel that are working on the event, testing, rallying, and at the factory. It's a great feeling to be part of that. It is quite a crucial thing, of course, it depends a lot on the individuals. Of course, we did a lot of work, a lot of recce practice, quite a lot of testing before we went and did the first rally. It really helps if you can get along, judging that we spend probably as much time together in the year as you do with wives almost. Between regular testing and the events themselves, life in the WRC is relentless for the crews, and the co-driver's role is one of the toughest. The recce is probably one of the most intensive times and demanding times for a co-driver. Let's say we go to a new rally, we're like completely blank books. We do the recce, which is obviously very important, but and even when we get back to the hotel, we have to tidy and rewrite all of the pace notes so they're readable and clear for when we get to the event. Even on the Thursday when there's a lot of PR or maybe even a ceremonial start or a super special, this day can be quite chaotic and quite hard to keep your head in the right place. Now in their third season at Toyota, the British pair have netted four victories and 11 podiums from just 23 starts. And at every round, preparation is key. I think being organised, being able to read the notes, your voice is very important, the preparation side, it's all a very complex role. It's a three right long in, three left plus caution, don't have a jump down, sudden five right sharp caution to lose. But of course someone who's experienced as Scott has the ability to say when things are right or wrong. So definitely he can offer his opinion, he knows when to offer his opinion and when not to, I think that's probably a sign of a good co-driver as well. After coming heartbreakingly close to a first world championship in 2020 and finishing a close second again last year, the Toyota duo are determined to add to their impressive tally this season. We've got one goal and that's to win. And if it means saying one or two things that might come across a bit harsh or a bit direct, you just have to take it on the chin. I've worked with many different drivers and it's been a good experience and I've learned a lot from every one of them. Things are working really well with myself and Elvin and uh, long may that continue. Get in. <laughs> Time now to head onto the grid. In US sports car racing, it was a good start to May for Porsche customer teams in the IMSA WeatherTech race at Laguna Seca. The FAF Porsche won in GTD Pro, while Wright Motorsports sailed to victory in the GTD class. At Mid-Ohio, it was Acura making the headlines in the top DPI category. In a fantastic scrap for the lead, a slight touch from Ricky Taylor sent Renger van der Zander's Cadillac spinning. Taylor roared away to take his fourth mid-Ohio victory in five years, much to the delight of his dad. The World Endurance Championship at Spa-Francorchamps saw Toyota avenge their first ever defeat in the hypercar class at the hands of Alpine. 
Victory for the number seven car and relief for the Japanese mark ahead of the Le Mans 24 hours. There was plenty of weather watching as IndyCar teams descended on Indianapolis for the month of May and in the Indy road course race, Scott McLaughlin paid for his decision to stay on the slicks. Pato Award then spun behind the safety car before Juan Pablo Montoya brought out the final yellow on lap 72, which handed victory to leader Colton Herder with no time to restart the race. Two weeks later, it was time for the Indy 500 itself. And our one is on the attack! Okay. Ericsson won't let it happen! All crash! It'll finish under caution! Everybody, you just won the Indy 500! Marcus Ericsson wins the Indianapolis 500 in the most dramatic way! In Formula One, Max Verstappen making headlines in Miami. Celebrating his Grand Prix victory, the Red Bull Ace took a dip at the nearby Florida Motorsport Park in a 900 horsepower V8 Swamp Buggy. It's really amazing to drive one of these things. Um, you know, it's so different to what we are used to. With Red Bull, you know you are in for some crazy things and this is just another level again. The experience inspired him to victory at the Spanish Grand Prix and a podium in Monaco. In NASCAR at Kansas, reigning champion Kyle Larson managed to save himself from spinning at two-thirds distance, but 2021 champion Chase Elliott couldn't save this one with a tyre spinning down the track. Larson battled hard with Kurt Busch at the end of the race, but couldn't hold him off. Busch finally took his first win of the season. May also meant NASCAR's longest race, the Coca-Cola 600. Four wide. Oh, oh the reckon. Unbelievable. And the caution waves. Denny Hamlin, Kyle Busch, teammates at Joe Gibbs Racing. And they come to the line. Hamlin wins by two car lengths. What a race. Finally, the World Rally Championship was in Portugal, where Toyota's Elvin Evans and Scott Martin were untouchable for the first two days. However, teammate Calo Rovampera and co-driver Yoni Haltunen overhauled the pair on Saturday evening and sealed the deal on Sunday to take their third consecutive victory. To end today, we get the inside line on endurance racing's most prestigious championship with Porsche. With elite drivers and manufacturers going head-to-head -head on the world's most iconic racetracks, the World Endurance Championship is sports car racing's greatest spectacle. The WEC is uh, a great championship. Uh, we have a lot of great teams, a lot of great drivers. It's a world championship, so you are racing against some of the very best drivers and teams in the world. We have a, a six hours race, eight hours, 24 hours. We covered all the endurance races. I was part of the WEC since the beginner, and the championship just grew up so much. Incredible. I was lucky to see how the the people improve, the level of the team improves, the level of the drivers improves, and now most everybody wants to be here and racing in the WC. In a multi-million dollar world tour, prototype hypercars and production-based sports cars do battle at Sebring, Spa, Le Mans, Monza, Fuji and Bahrain, and the title of world champion is the prize. The WEC Championship is a world endurance championship, it means uh, you are champion of the world when you win it so this says something you know I've been lucky enough or good enough to win it a few years ago and it's really a big joy it's something very special to be world champion world champions are made in the WEC and at the heart of the calendar is the greatest endurance race of them all the 24 hours of Le Mans the effort we put in to be successful there is tremendous I mean we basically all year long we try to be really prepared for Le Mans but I can tell you, having been there basically since 2007 every year, you can't be 100% prepared for Le Mans. Whatever you do, it's such a unique and special track. It's a crown jewel of this calendar. It's where the pressure is at its highest and it's where you as a driver want to peak as well on your performance. So, yeah, you've got to deliver. The WEC is the ultimate test of machinery and manufacturers use works teams of highly skilled engineers, mechanics and factory drivers to showcase their car's performance. We run the 911 RSR. You need about 35 people, uh, mechanics, tire mechanics, logistics, truck drivers, the engineers. And we are competing in the factory class against Ferrari and Corvette. And therefore, it's very important that we are there and show also on the racetrack that we are probably the best manufacturer out there. Most people don't understand how much effort it is to become a factory driver because you already have spent thousands of euros in go-kart, in formula. You have had good days, bad days, 
finding teams, finding sponsors, all this effort, nobody sees. They just see us, okay, now he's in a factory team, everything is sorted. The Porsche GT team are one of the best, and the factory drivers carry the expectation of continuing the Stuttgart Mark success. It has a lot of history behind its brand. We're having a lot of great engineers, and the team itself works very well together, so it of course puts some pressure on you as a driver to deliver, because the aim is clear, you want to win when you go racing for Porsche. There is only one goal, every time we go racing, try to win, try to do a best result as possible, and this is what we try to do all the time when we are out there. If you have a chance to win, you have to be committed and you have to go for it. The only result we have to bring home, it's the victory. Victory at Le Mans would be the perfect prize in Porsche's final works campaign with the 911 RSR as they look towards next year and a new start in the WEC's hypercar class. This is the biggest race in the world for us and for us the most important. You have a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions. The parade, the national anthem just before the start is something which you remember every year and that's bring your heartbeat probably a few heartbeats faster. But also I think about my career at this stage and think about how proud I can be to be part of this program and be part of Porsche driving a, a factory car in Le Mans. Next time, we're in France for the 24 hours of Le Mans and why Arik Almarola is stepping away from NASCAR. We'll see you then on Mobile One The Grid.